Page 27, um, it's the act of charity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O oh my God, I love you above all things, with my whole heart and soul, because you are infinitely good and deserving of all my love. I love my neighbor as myself for love of you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Uh, the gospel for um, this lesson is, is the rich young ruler. And in, I believe it's Matthew's gospel, he actually identifies this person as the rich young ruler. And Mark's gospel, which, we're, which we'll read and study um, in this lesson, uh, it just says a man ran up to Jesus. So we do know that this is a, a rich young man. Um, and so, you know, as we read this, there's just so much that we can pull from it. As Jesus was sitting Setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He replied and said to him, Teacher, all of these things I have observed from my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, You are lacking in one thing. Go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At that statement his face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. So Jesus again said to them in reply, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of, an, of a needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were exceedingly astonished and said among themselves, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For human beings this is impossible, but not for God. All things are possible for God. Peter began to say to him, We have given up everything and followed you. Jesus said, Amen, I say to you, there is no one who has given up house or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more now in this present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. There's a few... Um, a few things that I think really, even though we're going to talk about uh, primarily um, the, the lacking the one thing, that's what this lesson's on. But before that, I think there's some initial things that just need to be covered because they're such big questions. And, and especially um, as a group does Lexio Divina, these questions will come up. The first one is um, that it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And, and this has to be really um, seen in its context, which was, uh, in the time of Jesus, there was a wall around the city, and, and there would have been a, a path where the people would have walked through, but then there would have been a path where the animals, an eye of a needle, would have been. And, <clears throat> and then, for obvious reasons, if you have all your animals going through the main path, um, there's going to be poop there, it's going to be stinky, you know, and it's not a very uh, nice place to welcome the guests uh, to your city. So, as the people are walking through this main gate, you know, it would be the camel that would be going through this gate. And a few things to, to kind of remember about this, this would have been a small passage, so if a, if a camel had a lot of stuff on it, um, actually these things would be, have to be taken off. So there's a few things that would have to happen for the camel to pass through the eye of the needle, which is also necessary for us to get into heaven. The first thing is, things must be taken off. Um, whatever it is that we have attachments to in this world, we must lose those attachments. We may be free from the attachment of sin, um, and anything that we may love more than God, or anything that we may fear more than God. 
Um, and that's kind of our downfalls. Either we fear something more than God or we love something more than God or we're, we're clinging to it. Um, those, that's the first step. We must uh, have those peeled away. Uh, we think of our Lord's words, deny yourself, right? Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Um, the next step would have been after shedding all of those goods, shedding the stuff that's on his back, then the camel would actually have to get down on its knees, um, humble itself, get down lower, and, and then so that it can be in position to enter, and then would have to be, be really literally pushed through the eye of the needle. So we think of this spiritually for us. How are we going to get to heaven? Well, first off, um, it's only possible with God. Jesus makes that very clear that getting to heaven, man cannot do that on their own. On their own. If that was possible, Mo Moses would have been able to do it without Jesus. Abraham would have been able to do it without Jesus. And, and we know that that's not true. It's not the law that saved those people, but it's Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who saved them. And that's why Jesus Christ would have to be the one that welcomed them into heaven after he opened heaven's gates. But when we go back to the camel, we first must, um, after knowing that it comes from only from God, he is asking us, Jesus Christ is asking us to shed the stuff of the world, to shed ourselves of our sin, especially our attachments to sin. Second, to humble ourselves and to make ourselves small. Okay? Um, unless you become like a child, we must make ourselves small. And then third, we need to um, not only, we have to be willing to be pushed, which means a little bit of discipline. We, we needed to be prodded by our friends, pushed by our friends. We need to be pushed by the church. We need to be pushed by our Lord um, because it's not something that nat is going to necessarily come natural to us, but it's something that we need grace for. Um, and I think this goes really in line well with the deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. If you think about those steps, you know, deny yourself by shedding away this sin and these attractions to the things of the world, these attachments. Um, pick up your cross, which means the humbling, right? Um, the, the humbleness, the smallness, which is our Lord shows us. And then follow me. And following me means following a church that's going to push me. It's going to challenge me. Um, so that's what the eye of the needle means. It goes really well with the other command of Christ. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Um, the second thing that I think is just, just really interesting in this is the conversation, the initial conversation that Jesus has. Um, the, man, the man says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit life? And, and Jesus says, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? Now notice, Jesus does not negate the fact that he is good, and he doesn't deny the fact that he's good, he doesn't deny the fact that he's God. He does not say that anywhere here. He's just asking a question. Why do you call me good? He's not denying that he is good, and he's not denying that he is God. He is just wanting to know, why does this man call him good? Um, what's his motive for calling him good? What's his insight on this? Um, and then Jesus says, no one is good but God. Once again, this is not a statement saying that he is not God. There are some people that may twist this scripture and, and say that what Jesus is saying here is that he's different from God. But he's not different. He's of the same essence, right? The same substance, consubstantial with the Father, of the same substance. He is divine. Um, none, nothing in these two statements is Jesus saying that I am not God, I am not good, I am not divine. Um, what he's saying is no one is good but God alone. So if you see that I am good, and it is true, of course, that he is good, um, where does that goodness come from? Well, that goodness comes from the fact that I am God. And, and I think it's good now to then ask, why are we good? If I'm good at all, why am I good? I'm only good because of God. Um, now, there, there's, a, there's a, obviously a distinction here. Jesus is, by nature, what we are 
by grace. Very important to understand this. So, what is this that we are? Jesus is, by nature, what we are by nature. What is Jesus and what are we? Jesus is good. And, and how is it that he's good? He's good because he is divine. It is, he's both divine and man. He's both human and God. It's, it's because he is divine. It's, it's his nature. His nature is complete goodness. Why do you call me good? Do you see that I'm divine? Do you understand that I'm God? Why are you calling me good? Because you know that all goodness comes from God. No one is good but God alone. So if I am all good, then I am all God. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, we can't say the same thing because we don't have a divine, uh, we don't have divine life by our nature. It's something that is foreign to us. We are given it by grace. So what we are, good, only can happen by God's grace. That's why he says, by humans this is impossible, but by God this is impossible, but by God it is possible. So, a human, we are good by grace, Jesus is good by his nature. He is good because he is God. Um, I think it's important to kind of to go through that as well. And I think now having these, kind of these two um, really big scriptures that we're wondering, what is this saying here? I think it's important to cover those two things. Um, but really, the heart of this lesson is on the one phrase, you are lacking in one thing. And we say, well, what, what is he lacking? In this part of the gospel, it's what's missing that really tells us a lot. Um, you, you know the commandments is what Jesus says. Um, and he lists, um, he lists, he doesn't list all the commandments. Notice what he lists. He says, you shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness or lie, right? Um, and you shall not defraud, which would be steal. Um, and you should honor, honor your father and mother. So killing is commandment five. Adultery is commandment six. Stealing is commandment seven. Um, connected with ten as well. You should not covet your neighbor's good. Six is connected to nine. You should not covet your neighbor's spouse. And then uh, lie is number eight, and father and mother is number four. So what we have here is the commandments number four through ten. So you are lacking in one thing. What's missing here? What is the thing that he's lacking? Well, he's lacking the observance of commandments one through three. He... And what are those commandments? All of these have to do with his relationship with God. Okay, the first one being, you shall have no other gods. The second one is, you shall honor the name of God. And the third one has to do with worship, keep holy the Sabbath. If we can't get these things right, there is no way that we can properly do these. If, um, and it really puts our relationship with God, which is Jesus Christ, right? The second person of the Trinity, true God and true man, is the one thing necessary. So this might be asking the question, why do you say that I'm good? Who, in other words, it's almost kind of another take on who do you say that I am? Um, do you think I'm God? And, and, and if so, um, when I look at you and I love you and I invite you, what is your response to the living God? And that's what Jesus does here. He looks at him, he loves him, and he invites him. Um, we don't see judgment here at all. This is very important that we don't see judgment here. There will be a time when Jesus Christ judges each person. But that time is not now. Um, Jesus says, I have not come to condemn, but to save the world. We have the beautiful gift of time. I mean, if we think about that, we may have 80 years or 90 years or even 100 years. And those 80, 90, 100 years, they are spent with Jesus looking at us, loving us, 
and inviting us. And we have to say, do we see him looking at us? Do we feel him loving us? And do we answer that invitation? Because that's what's happening. There will be a time, however, where he will judge us at the end of our life. And he will ask us, when I looked at you, did you look back? When I loved you, did you love back? And when I invited you, did you answer? And we will have to be accountable for that. Um, so the one thing necessary, Jesus is trying to say, I am necessary. I am necessary. I am in front of you. I am loving you, looking at you, inviting you. I am the one thing necessary. You're doing all of this, but you're lacking a relationship with me. You know? And, and he, particularly this comes in the form of possessions. For instance... If Jesus were to come to me and say, and, and I, or actually I were to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, what do I need to have to have eternal life? What's necessary for eternal life? And he were to say, well, you know, are you Catholic? And I say, yeah, I'm Catholic. You know, I go to Mass every Sunday. I go to confession pretty regularly. I, I pray before meals and I take my kids to CCD class. And then he would say, well, that's good. You've done a great job, Matt. That's awesome. And then he says, but you're lacking one thing. And maybe he pulls out for me, he'd probably say you're lacking in a hundred things. But, 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 you know, he would start to then dig into the areas that I really have a hard time with. He would look at me. He would love me. But then he would really kind of dig into the things that I'm struggling with. And, and that's when I might not be able to take that. That's when I might feel sad and my face may drop and I may actually turn away sad, just like this young man did. Um... But all of those things that we really struggle with, whatever our sin is, and we'll talk about those in just a second, whatever it is that's the one thing lacking in our life, or the five things, or the seven things, or the ten things, they all truly are rooted in this right here. Am I putting something more than God? In other words, do I love something more than God? Or do I fear or respect something else's, someone else's opinion more than God? Um, do, am I willing to protect the holy name of God? Do I say his name with reverence and will I stand up for him? Um, do I defend him? You know, do, do, am I willing to, um, really show the dignity of God, the awe, the respect, right? Proper due to the holy name of Jesus. Um, and then do I worship him? You know, not just, um, of, of course, keeping our obligation to go to mass, but do I fully enter into worship um, of Him? Do I sacrifice and, and give myself completely to Him? Um, do I prepare myself to receive the Holy Eucharist? And do I take away the spiritual reading and just love them? And do I take in all the chants and, and, the, and the scripture that's given to me at Mass? All of that. And why do I do all of that out of love of God? And if this stuff is happening correctly, if our relationship with God is right which is the one thing necessary, all of these struggles that we have um, will then start to, to be able to be handled um, by the grace of God. Um, so we look at this, we can also look at it in, in another way here. And I'll um, just kind of want to erase this here. And, and a priest uh, said this to me once in confession, and I think it, it just really helped me out. He said that sloth is kind of the gateway in to the other seven deadly sins. So from sloth, it's the opening door into really our home, um, our, our body, our soul. Um, when, we, when we become slothful, we let Satan in to our life. And at that point, once sloth enters in, you can either take a right or a left. If you take a right, then you move into the world of the senses. My feelings, the things that I want to sense. And this would be greed, lust, and gluttony. If I, um, if I go to the, the left, I kind of move into, into really, I guess, my relationships with people, right? Um, my relationships. This is kind of how I deal with myself, in a sense. And this is how I deal with others. This kind of also deals with my courage and my, my fortitude. Um, and this would have to do with our pride, envy, 
and anger. You see now, what, what I've done by sloth, by, by allowing Satan in this door, is, is I have not followed the, the advice of St. Peter, for instance, who says, you know, be sober and alert because Satan is prowling like a roaring lion seeking to devour your soul. Well, when I, when I am slothful, I refuse to be diligent and I refuse to be on top of things in my life. Um, I, I lack prayer. I lack discipline. I kind of let my guard down and then Satan comes right in. Um, and so we can't allow that to happen. We, we spiritually, of course, we think of sloth as just like sitting on the couch and eating a bunch of food and just being lazy, but it's not laziness. It's, it's sloth is just the lack of desire to do God's will. Sloth is the opposite of blessed are those who hunger and thirst. I have no desire to guard my soul. I have no desire to guard the soul of my family, to guard the soul of others. I have to be diligent. I have to be a soldier. I have to protect. You know, one of the things that we are called to do by our, our confirmation as Catholics is we are now the soldiers. And as soldiers of Christ, we are to protect every citizen of heaven, um, every citizen of the church. So, sloth lets us in. Um, you could say that, that sloth kind of centers on our devotion to God. You know, when someone says, well, he's a devout Catholic. Well, that means that's someone that is, is on, uh, keeping guard. Um, like the ten virgins that are waiting vigil for the bridegroom to come back. So there's a lot of um, examples that our Lord gives of this, even parables where people have to be on watch, um, keep vigil, right? And so with this, I think you could say that this has to do with our relationship with God. Like the ten virgins, are we eagerly awaiting Him? Um, and like so many other stories, are we um, protecting ourselves and are we ready for God? So this has to do, I think, with our relationship with God. A lot of these first three commandments, um, you know, commandments one through three, I think we can go back and see that all of these have to do with, you know, how we appease ourselves. Um, we can talk about a lot of these, lust being uh, number six and nine, um, greed, um, I, don't, I don't know where that would tie in, uh, probably, I guess, seven and ten, the desire to to have what other people have, right? Um, I think pride, with, with this is all of our dealings with others. Um, so pride, I think, sometimes would have to do with honoring our parents. Um, so we have four there. Uh, eight has to do with lying. So I'm not sure that might also have to do with our pride. Um, and then which one are we missing here? Four, five is, is killing, uh, which, which, you know, have to do with maybe anger or, again, pride. So we see that all the Ten Commandments are kind of here, linked in with the seven deadly sins, but the seven deadly sins kind of are in three components. Our relationship with God, and then letting our guard down, not letting God be in a, a part of our life, not protecting the one thing necessary. You know, Jesus is the one thing necessary. If we remember the story about Mary and Martha, um, he, he tells very clearly, he says to Martha, Mary has chosen the one thing necessary, and it won't be taken from him. That means if we choose Jesus Christ, if, if we choose Jesus Christ, he will not be taken from us. If we partake in the divine life, the divine knife will not be taken from us. No one can take the divine life from us, not Satan or not anyone else. The, only, the, real, the reality is if we lose the divine life, it's of our own doing. We have let it go. We have given it up. Sloth ensures that we do not give up the one thing necessary. Um, in protecting this gate, we protect ourselves against the sins of greed, lust, and gluttony. We, we learn to have moderation and temperance. You know, and, and keeping this, this, this gate to our soul, um, you know, obviously guarded, then we, we have good relationships with others. Um, and this would have to do with, of course, charity, but also in a sense of, of uh, fortitude and an assurance that we can do the right thing. Um, so with all of this, um, I think it's important that, that we look at these stories, um, especially of this rich young ruler, and realize that he still has time to change. He walks away sad in this gospel, um, which is kind of one of those gospels that ends on a negative note. He walks away sad, but he's young too. And, and he has time to change. There are many times, unfortunately, in our life that we have been slothful. We have let Satan into our life. 
We have let him destroy um, relationships with others, our relationship with others, and even destroy, in a sense, our own relationship with ourself and our desires. And um, But we still have time to realize that Jesus is still looking at us, he is still loving us, and he is still inviting us to come and follow him. And, and he will continue to do that. Uh, there's not a minute that goes down in our a minute that goes by in our life that he's not looking at us, loving us, and inviting us. Um, so we don't need to be sad. We don't need to walk away sad. We need to um, ask for the grace necessary to shed ourselves of, of any attachment to the worldly goods, to shed ourselves of anything that would be holding ourselves back um, from this relationship with God. We need to make ourselves small, humble ourselves, um, crouch down, and we need to allow ourselves to be pushed, pushed by Christ, pushed by the church. Um, and, and, and part of that, of course, is, is the community that is in our church, our friends, our family, to push us to holiness. We have to believe that we can be holy. And, and we have to also believe that other people can be holy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.